Thank you, Seth. Take Thank you. Appreciate the introduction. Um, when I said I was going to come and do this, I don't know. I didn't really realize or think about the fact that like 80% of the people in this room were going to be way more knowledgeable on the subject than I am. So uh, I hope that uh, you'll bear with me if I'm kind of like still a noob, I think, compared to a lot of you guys. But um, I uh, this is going to be not too technical of a talk. It's going to be more kind of conceptual and just like approaches we've taken and stuff. Um, like was said, I, I've been with the Idaho National Lab for about five years. Prior to that, I worked as a senior software developer for um, uh, McAfee on, on their SIM product and in IPS, IDS. Um, and so I, I, my original kind of study and background and stuff was, was just computer science, but I kind of fell into the cyber world uh, out of college. And I just kind of have been there since doing, doing software and R&D and stuff around the cybersecurity space. So um, over the last couple of years, me and some of my colleagues have been working on uh, uh, various projects dealing with industrial control systems and trying to extend our network visibility into those uh, systems, which is kind of a unique set of, of a lot of similarities, but also a lot of unique differences as compared to like the IT world. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the parsers and stuff that we've written as, uh, as a result of that project. Um, so, as I mentioned, what we found a lot is uh, even when we come in to, to do assessments or to look at networks uh, where they've got pretty good visibility into their IT traffic, their corporate zone or whatever, in industrial control systems, a lot of the time that traffic uh, visibility isn't there. It's more lacking. Uh, and so I, I work in a group called the Advanced Analytics Lab at, uh, at the INL. And, um, you know, we've just noticed that there's a lot of great solutions out there for, uh, you know, robust parsers and analytics for protocols that you will find on the uh, IT networks, but often in um, operational technology, OT networks, uh, with ICS devices, there's, there's limited uh, visibility into those. Um, so this capability gap has kind of spurred this development of uh, this, and there's Hope, I'm gonna, I've tried to avoid the alphabet soup. Being a government contractor, it does kind of infect me a little bit, but I'll try not to be too uh, acronym heavy on this. Um, but the project's called the Industrial Control Systems Network Protocol Parsers, or ICSNPP for short. Um, and it has been developed to, uh, at, at the direction of DHS CISA to try to expand um, what we can see in OT protocols, and, and we do those by writing them in Zeek and then publishing on them on GitHub. Um, and so one of the other major goals of this is to try to increase kind of the knowledge of the inner workings of these protocols among those who might be interested in them um, by, by integrating them with other tools and uh, at the biannual uh, industrial control systems joint working group we do like CTFs and stuff that, that revolve around the data that's parsed out of these uh, ICS protocols so that people can familiarize themselves more with what's going on in their industrial networks. Um, so in case you don't already know how to go to GitHub, right, there's a screenshot of it. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been published to GitHub uh, under Sysgov's GitHub repo um, and uh, registered in the Zeek package management repository. They've also been integrated into Malcolm, which is a, another tool that I work on at the, at the lab um, that uh, pulls the Zeek logs and uh, puts them into Elastic along with Archimede and some other things like that. Um, so far, we've got eight full protocol parsers in the uh, ICSNPP project, and then two other packages that extend logging capabilities for some of Zeek's um, existing protocol parsers. I'm not going to bore you too much with all the details, but I will just run through the ones that we've got out there so far. Um, BACnet, if you're not familiar with ICS protocols, maybe some of these will be the first time you've heard of them, maybe not. Uh, BACnet, the BAC stands for Building Automation and Control, and so it's the communication standard for things like heating and ventilation and air conditioning and lighting control and access control and fire suppression systems. Um, this was one of the first ones that we put out when we started this project, so it was released uh, January 2021. Uh, it's written in bin pack, and um, this is one that's still in active development. I know that uh, I think Keith Jones has been using this, uh, I want to say, and opened some PRs for us. Um, and so this is, this is still kind of ongoing as we, as we find new ways to improve and fix it. Uh, BSAP is a general use protocol. Uh, it's suitable for synchronous and asynchronous networks. Um, and uh, it's often seen over serial as well as Ethernet encapsulated. 
Um, so, you know, we've, we've kind of got two branches of this parser. For the serial one, obviously, it's like a, with a serial tap or whatever, it's encapsulated in Ethernet anyway so that we can see it with Z. Um, this was also written in BinPack and has been around since about April of last year. Uh, EtherCAT is a protocol designed for uh, real-time distributed control of industrial systems, and it's got this goal of having um, short cycle times and low communication jitter. Uh, this one was released last summer. Um, despite what you'd think with Ethernet IP, this next one, the IP does not, does not it's, it's industrial protocol. Uh, I don't know why they picked that name. You'd think that there's already like some some they would have done a Google search or something, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's uh, kind of confusing on that one, but um, uh, it adapts the common industrial protocol, CAP, for Ethernet networks. Its object-oriented design makes it widely used in all sorts of industrial networks, and from what Wikipedia told me last night, it has about 30% of the uh, share of industrial Ethernet networks traffic. Um, this one was also released with our first batch of partner, uh, parsers back in 2021 in January. Genesis, um, if you've never heard of this one, well, neither had I before I wrote the parser for it. Uh, it's an obscure protocol used in the, I mean, I don't know how obscure it is. To me, the railway industry was obscure anyway. Uh, but it's in the railway industry for signaling and switching. It's, a, it's very similar to Modbus in its design in that it's a client server model and you don't get a whole lot of information from it other than just like register values and things. Um, this was the first one that I, I uh, the first ICS parser that I wrote in Spicy and it was released earlier this year. Um, OPC UA binary. OPC UA is an open communication standard for data exchange between industrial sensors and cloud applications. Uh, and there's two kind of main protocols that implement the OPC UA standard. One is a web services based and the other is binary for which we've written and are still writing this parser. Um, side note, if you're driving past Idaho Falls on your way to like a Yellowstone National Park vacation and you hear wailing and gnashing of teeth, don't worry, it's probably just my coworkers, uh, Kent Carfort and Melanie Pierce, that are still working on this parser because um, there's dozens of services and uh, they've been going at it for a long time. And so we're actually gonna circle back around to this one towards the end of my presentation. Uh, S7COM is kind of our most recent one that we've released. Um, it's, and its successor, S7COM Plus, uh, are uh, proprietary for Siemens programmable logic controllers, but we do see a lot of those out there. Um, it sits on top of COTP, which is the Connection Oriented Transport Protocol. Uh, it was released earlier this summer. And then finally, one that's a work in progress. You can see my little under construction man there. Um, Sometime within the next few weeks or maybe months, you're going to see the release of our Profinet IO context manager parser. Um, Profinet is a widely used Ethernet based uh, ICS protocol that's also designed to deliver data in real time networks where timing is critical. I've been told in weekly status meetings for like six months that this is almost done. So uh, we should be seeing it any moment now. Um, and then finally, the ones that I mentioned where we extend existing parsers. Um, no changes to like the underlying Z code in these ones, but we've got some scripting, some script land stuff that um, creates additional log files with a lot more details about DNP3 and Modbus, which are um, the, the ICS protocols that Zeek already has built in support for. And it does add a lot, a lot more detail uh, if you need that. Um, kind of uh, not an ICS protocol, but just kind of worth mentioning, uh, I also wrote the LDAP protocol parser, or kind of extended like some long abandoned Hilti code from like some of the earlier proof of concepts of what later became spicy. Um, LDAP is the core underlying protocol of Active Directory and it in turn is ASN.1 based. I just mentioned it because it was my first, my first exposure to spicy and I learned a lot while building it. Um, since my initial work on it, it's gone over to live on Zeke's GitHub and has been extended further by other developers. So uh, there's still a lot of functions, I think, that aren't totally implemented yet, but the important stuff is pretty much there. Um, and then uh, the other stuff that I've done parser-wise, when Zeek 4 and then when Zeek 5 came out, um, I needed to get a whole bunch of plugins working with those. Uh, and so I submitted like a bunch of pull requests to all sorts of different third-party uh, uh, repositories to, to try to fix things and get things working in those versions of Zeek. Um, and uh, I just mentioned that because 
is, is coming into Zeek parser, writing Zeek parsers or Zeek packages is something you're interested in, that's a really, really good way to do it. And that was a great way to do it for me is to get into the code of the, the parsers um, that we're already using or that we're interested in and, and just kind of learn how they work through, um, through debugging them or whatever. And you can go, like I did, from someone who felt like he never knew what he was doing to someone who almost sometimes doesn't feel like you know what he's doing. So I still, I still feel like I've got a long ways to go, but, but it did help me a lot. Um, so what a cool project, I can hear you all saying, uh, how will you decide what protocols to write parsers for next? Uh, well, I'm very glad you asked me that question, thank you. Uh, a few uh, considerations come into play as we try to, to prioritize the list of parsers, because there's a huge list of ICS protocols out there, and some of them are really obscure and some of them are really common, and so we're always trying to figure out like what would be the next place to focus our resources on. Uh, firstly, the frequency observed in the wild, in, in our customer or in our stakeholder networks. Um, obviously, the more common an unparsed protocol is, particularly for us when it's used in critical infrastructure, the higher priority it is for us. And so second, kind of along with that, is requests from the community. Uh, one of the big reasons that the DHS CISA is driving this project is to respond to the needs of the OT community at large. So we, we want to keep our finger on the pulse of that, of that community and see where those needs are. Um, the availability of resources can be a big driver as to whether or not we feel we can tackle a new parser. This includes documentation and standards, uh, whether there's existing other implementations like you know, server client libraries or Wireshark dissectors, whatever there is out there. Um, test PCAP is a big one and we're going to talk about that here in a second. And then finally, just protocol complexity, or, or to phrase it another way, how long, like how long before we can have some minimum viable product that we can that we can get out and that will be useful to someone. Even for complex parsers, we we prefer to do like a release early with a partially implemented parser that has the core stuff. Maybe it's just like logging out function names right along with the timestamp, and then periodically put out updates. As we, as we flush out the protocol a little bit more. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of the challenges we face as we try to build these new parsers. Um, a lot of us at the start of this, a couple of years ago, had not ever really done Zeek parser development before. Um, we, were, uh, we were new to that and so these are just some of the lessons that we learned as we got into it. If you've been writing Zeek parsers for a long time, like at the end of this you're gonna say, yeah, I already knew all of that stuff. But, um, but two years ago, I didn't know that. So maybe some of you guys or somebody watching online will, will uh, this will help them think of some of these things before they come to the same hurdles that we came to. Um, number one is uh, lack of packet captures. That is probably our most ongoing issue if we're trying to, to, to build out a parser that we don't currently have support. Uh, some ICS protocols are really obscure. They're used on some legacy device that you know, is from an out of business manufacturer or they're very specialized niche kind of domain or they're proprietary. And so without packet captures which provide good coverage for all the nooks and crannies of that protocol, uh, it's almost impossible to fully test a parser and ensure that we're capturing the fields correctly without major issues or crashes or whatever. Um, we've used a variety of methods to try to get PCAPs as we're, as we're trying to uh, put together what we need to build a parser, including um, you know, doing open source research, finding stuff online, um, I've got a link there actually where I've collected a big list of like a lot of different PCAP sources that I've found online that are just public and open that I've, that I've scoured and downloaded different things from uh, and then collected them there on GitHub. Um, we've, we've got a kind of a test bay in, uh, at the INL called Cellar, um, Control Environment Laboratory Resource. We, that's a backronym by the way, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this because government loves acronyms, but we were in Idaho, right? It's the potatoes, so we called it the seller, like a potato seller. That's the thing people who have potatoes have. Um, anyway, we have this test bed which has got all these different skids for like the different chemical and oil and natural gas and electrical and um, all these different sectors and then different kinds of devices that would be used in those sectors and so we'll capture packets based off of that. Um, we've also done a lot of scripting, right? Creating custom packet captures through scripting with with Python packages that we've got or proof of concepts or reference implementations on GitHub and then just like using Scapy to, to generate the PCAP. 
that's not always ideal because I found that the real world doesn't always super line up with the test implementations and the like proof of concept libraries, but sometimes it's better than nothing. Uh, so real data is always best, right? Quite a few times we've been approached, or we'll approach a customer, uh, or we'll be inter you know, interfacing with a customer and they'll say, can you, you know, can you guys develop a parser for FUBAR protocol 20XD6? And we're like, absolutely, sure. You know, are you willing to share some PCAP off of your network with us to allow us to do that? And then it's just like crickets, right? They just look at us with surprise Pikachu face and they're like, what? Um, and so, you know, there's, there's our reasons, though, that they might not be able to share that with us. It might be that they just don't have the knowledge or the resources to take that capture. Uh, it might be that there's regulations about uh, PII or PCII, and they're wary of giving us captured traffic because of those regulations. And so sometimes you have to address those and say, like, okay, right, there's tools maybe for PCAP uh, anonymization or, or sanitization like Trace Wrangler or PCAP sanitizer or something like that that could help scrub some of that data out but still give you useful information um, or maybe you know you need to sign an NDA or something like that. But, but having good PCAP is, is like the first. Um, uh, close behind though is access to standards or specifications. Um, accurate and thorough documentation obviously is key for determining service and function codes and protocol structures and field sizes and logic flow. Uh, fortunately, a lot of the standards that we've used as we've developed these have been open source or, or published freely, but others, unfortunately, right, require accounts and subscriptions and partnerships and paid access. That's not necessarily a deal breaker, right, if you or your employer is willing to shell out the money for that, but um, it is one more hoop to jump through. One illustration kind of on the importance of good documentation um, and how you weigh that against the availability of traffic is this Genesis parser that I mentioned a minute ago. It's this protocol that's used to control uh, SCADA field devices in the railway industry. So we were asked to create a parser for it. And honestly, I don't even remember who like the, the customer was or whatever. But the only resources we had was a little PCAP with like a thousand packets in it. And it was a midstream capture. So I had to like fake out the handshake with SCAPI to begin with. Um, and then I found a rejected Wireshark dissector patch that was submitted in 2008 and then they never like responded to it or whatever, so Wireshark closed it. Thank goodness it was archived. And that's what I had to go on. And, and so, um, you know, I was eventually able to Google foo up a PDF from some document on one of those like coolmanualsrs.com sort of a thing and it just like had this old archived PDF that touched on some of what the control codes and stuff meant. But like it was really just basically black box trying to figure out what was going on here. Luckily, this was a really simple protocol, kind of like Modbus. There wasn't a lot to it. And so we were able to um, represent those structures pretty easily and spicy. And actually, it was a really quick turnaround. But if that had been a more complicated protocol with, with that little documentation and that little PCAP, like there's no way we could have written a parser for it. Um, development learning curve, we found, is a big one for uh, when we're bringing on new people into the project, or maybe we've got new hires that haven't done this before, um, not everyone is a C++ programmer, right? Um, and, and I think there is a lot of overlap between the cyber field and like the the soft the computer science field, but it's not perfect overlap. Um, and so, uh, you know, writing C++, writing BIMPAC um, is is I think harder to get spun up on. This is why we really like Spicy, and we're looking at Spicy. For, for all the kind of future stuff that we've got going forward. Um, we feel it's, it's really become an excellent solution to this problem. So if you're not familiar with Spicy, I, I suggest you check it out. There's some great videos and stuff that, that Robin and others have got online um, about Spicy. Um, I'm sure Robin and, and Joanna and Benjamin and Keith Jones and others in the Spicy channel, like at some point or another, have been pretty tired of my questions while I was doing uh, the initial work on uh, the LDAP parser and the underlying ASM.1 structure decoding, but but I can tell you they were helpful and they were patient. And when I found a, a couple of bugs or issues in Spicy itself, they were always like grateful and responsive. So it's it's really the development on it is very inclusive and um, it's it's really I think taking off. And we're going to do all of our parser development going forward in Spicy. Um, another challenge is the development environment and and. Uh, Packaging plugin releases. Um, I mean, this is this is I think kind of a solved problem in continuous integration circles and stuff. But uh, you know, like I say, not all the new hires and stuff are necessarily 
you know, you say, okay, here's your new laptop. We're going to be writing a, a parser. Welcome to the team or whatever. And they're like, okay, I got to go install Zeek and I got to go make sure I got the right build tool chain to like compile these things and all this, right? And so uh, I'm, I'm really a containerize all the things docker slash podman zealot. And so that's a huge part of my personal development workflow. Um, so you can use the official Zeek Docker images or you can roll your own. Like I, I've done that has kind of some things the way I like it. And it's really nice to be able to drop quickly into a container. Um, I think I've actually got even a little way to show how that's done. Maybe if I can click on something, right? Just to, so you can see something move other than my lips. Right, you can clone your parser and you can um, make whatever changes you need to, you know, as you're, as you're testing it, as you're trying things out. Um, and then just drop into a container that is got your directory bind mounted into it and like ZKG install and away you go, right? It's very, it's a very easy way to just make sure that everyone's on the same page as far as the versions that you're using and the tool chain and uh, et cetera. Um, along the same lines as far as making things easier for people, improvements to the Zeek package manager, ZKG in the last couple of years have made, have made using ZKG and the Zeek packages repository a really, really easy and effective way for maintaining and distributing parsers. And so, um, you know, if you're working on this and you're like, okay, now I don't know what to do. I've, I've got this cool parser. I want to share it with the world. You can, you can go to Zeek Packages on GitHub and submit a pull request. And, you know, that will get reviewed and, and pulled in. And, and anyone in can, you know, anyone in the community that we're trying to work together and, and bring visibility and security into our networks uh, through that visibility can just with one command install your package and, uh, and away you go. Uh, one issue we've had, especially with ICS parsers, is the struggle to handle vendor-specific vendor fields. In protocols like Ethernet IP and CIP, many classes and services and service codes are ven can be vendor-defined, meaning that they'll, ven they'll uh, vary from, from vendor to vendor or even from site to site. And even worse, as you know, like standards are a good idea in, in theory, but Sometimes in practice, people don't actually follow them that closely. Um, and so not all vendors will interpret or conform to those standards in the same way. Um, to, to quote this uh, CIP publication, defining vendor-specific services according to the requirements of the product developer is possible. While this provides a lot of flexibility, the disadvantage of vendor-specific services is that they may not be understand, understood universally. And I can attest that that is true. Um, they are, uh, sometimes it can be really difficult because you write a parser and then you end up in, a, in an environment where the implementation there does not match what you had thought the protocol was. And so things don't look right or they don't parse right. And I don't really have a great solution to that, honestly. Like, there's not, there's not a super magic bullet for that. You can try to write robust parsers and use like error handling and, and you know, guess, guess what you got coming in. I actually feel like with Spicy, this is another place that really shines, is I'm less likely to like crash things with Spicy than I was. Uh, like with out of bounds or like, uh, you know, indexing an array that's incorrect or whatever, uh, which is I think more common before with your, when you're doing things in the C++ world. Um, but it's just something you have to be aware of. Um, protocol complexity. We talked about this a little bit before. Uh, if protocols like Modbus and Genesis are on the one end of the complexity spectrum, there's others that are really, really complicated, right? Uh, a good example of this is the OPC OA binary protocol which we're still developing and putting out updates to regularly. Um, so far, the, my colleagues have been working on this, Kent and Melanie that I mentioned earlier, um, have been, uh, they've, they've been like, they've implemented like two dozen or maybe 30 services and they've got like 65 still to go. Um, so when looking at a parser like this, you have to ask yourself some questions, right? How much detail do I need in the logs? Is, is an overview of the function names enough or do I need actual like register values and, and return codes and things like that? What's the purpose of the logs that I'm going to generate? Is it, um, is it for monitoring security? Is it for monitoring function? Uh, both. How are the internal structures of the protocol laid out? And, and what's the best way to represent those structures in flat Zeek log files? Sometimes, you know, and we've heard it today, and, and I, I'm generally one who ascribes to this, uh, to this axiom, but that more data is better, right? Or like, we'd rather have it and not need it than not have it. But like sometimes you do have to find what the right line is between underlogging and not having the information that you need and overlogging, you know, tying up processing resources, tying up storage uh, in, your, in your 
elastic indexes or, or wherever these are stored. Um, because, because, you know, a lot of protocols can be really, really uh, verbose if you, if you wrote the parser that way. So this OPC UA binary parser um, did present a unique set of challenges for us as there are so many services. And to complicate matters further, OPC UA binary message packets can contain complex nested structures and lists of structures and structures that reference the other structures that you already wrote log files for. And so we're left with the choice of making one giant log file with like, you know, 500 fields in it and, and most of the time they're all empty except for a few of them or breaking them out into per function logs. Um, and then you've got the issue of maintaining the links between these logs. Of course, we've got the Zeek UID, but um, a single session represented by, and, and you do want it tied together that way, but a single session represented by a connection UID could actually contain multiple distinct operations in OPC UA binary that could span multiple log files in a similar way as the UID did. So in the end, uh, we kind of didn't end up going with a one log file per function method and uh, kind of mimicking almost like a, a, a primary key, foreign key relationship in a, uh, in a relational database. We assign our own identifiers, similar to the UID, um, to operations which then we use to bridge those log files in a one-to-many relationship. So far this has worked well for us, but there's been a lot of kind of like hair pulled out and tears shed as we've, as we've tried to like find how, what's the best way to um, map the, all this complexity into these Zeek log files? And, and it's kind of continually uh, a challenge for us to figure out, you know, what's the right amount of data, what's the right amount of normalization versus denormalization for this data? Because what you end up with is this. This is the actual relationship between all of the different log files that we have uh, for the OPC UA binary. Um, it's kind of like a star schema, right? Where you've got like your fact table and your dimension table. So I've got the main OPC binary log that's like here's a thing that could happen. And then if it's a create session, I could have this whole kind of subset of create session logs that has their own kind of details. Um, like it's obviously not without complexity and, and uh, uh, you know, we look at this and we're not sure if we should be proud or ashamed. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, so where do we go from here? Uh, we really could use, if you or someone you love is in the OT slash ICS space and, uh, and they have input for us, we'd love to hear it. Uh, we'd love to help prioritize, we'd love your help in prioritizing our wish list of, of OT slash ICS network protocols that need protocol parsers. Um, so, like, you're welcome to reach out to us, reach out to me um, at, at the INL, and we can talk about what environment you're in and what protocols are being used that, that you don't think there's good coverage for, and, uh, and right, we'll run it up the flagpole, and, and maybe in sometime in the future we can help you out with that. Um, we, we welcome bug reports and enhancement requests for our existing ICS parsers. I know it's not an environment that everybody's got data in, and so our, our kind of like subset of people that are actually using these isn't super huge. Um, but if you, if you do use it and you find something that could be enhanced or fixed, let us know. Um, and finally, just as I kind of mentioned earlier, I can't say enough good things about Spicy. Uh, that's gonna be, I think, a big part of our development process going forward. Um, I don't know if I talked for five minutes or 30 minutes, but that's the end of my presentation. So if there's any questions or anything, I'd be happy to answer them. Or like I say, you can grab me afterwards and I'll give you a card or something like that. Thank you. Actually, I did just about right. Sweet. There's one back there. All right, got time for one or two questions real quick. First. It is so bright here, I can see. Well, I've got my uh, security hat much more on firmly than the uh, comprehensive how does things work. So it, it seems even harder than getting good traces and specs is to figure out what's security relevant about Absolutely. a protocol. Do you have any tips or tricks to share? Um, no, that is, that is one of the huge issues that we have is like um, as much as we want to be security focused in our log output, to be honest, even in the OT world, most of the incursions and stuff still come from the IT side, right? Um, and so like, usually because, I mean, there are cases in which people's OT networks are like directly exposed to the internet, and that's very bad, right, with a capital B, we all know that. 
But like in, in most cases, when you see uh, some small water municipality water company or something that's got like bad cyber activity going on to it, it's not it's not directly into that. It's from like remote desktop being left on or something like that, right? Um, and so we we'd love to have more examples of um, honestly, truly security security issues in ICS PCAP that we can point to and say this is bad stuff. Um, there are certain things we can certainly look for. What you do is you look for you know um, anomalies in the traffic, even more than the the content of the traffic itself. If your baseline is normally you know you've got some sensor on the dam that's that's reading just all the time it's reading right. We're not really changing things, but then all of a sudden you see a bunch of writes, you know, or, or something that's that's modifying behavior. These are often, you know, these are usually low change environments. They've been running the same year after year, decade after decade sometimes. Um, and so I think anomaly detection can be a way for us to take functional logs and kind of turn them into security information by, by looking at changes in, in those baselines and things like that. Um, or things like, you know, Uploading new firm like you can detect. Hey, we uploaded a new firmware binary to this PLC, or or we wrote ladder logic to it, or whatever, right? And it's like, are we really doing that? Is that is that really what we're intending to do? Thanks. Good question. Uh, hi, Seth. This is Ashish Sharma from Berkeley Lab. Uh, I had three things. So first of all, I mean, this is great work. I mean, you are filling up a void which was long felt and actually. Uh, desired for so when I went and looked at your github repo this this is really good stuff actually Thank you. and the second comment was actually about your talk I had bunch of questions and I was going to interrupt you but every time you go to the next slide you are answering these questions especially the pcaps uh, and especially the design of the logs like do you do a over logging under logging as well as the details you can put in so I, I might bu bu bug you for more details about certain things and my third thing was already asked by Smooth. So. Okay, well, great. Yeah. I'm so good at this. 